Faith is a journey, not a destination. And each of us, on our own journey, are called to live out our faith in Christ. Living our lives with God and for God. Living in this is an act of worship. Belonging to God and to each other. Relationships with one another encourage us and help us grow spiritually. Each of us being uniquely gifted by God. Sharing those gifts with others is a blessing. Stepping further into God's plan, reaching people with Christ's love here, near, and far. Well, good morning and welcome to everyone here, those joining us online and in Woodside. It's so good to be together with you today. Uh, my name is Zach Bush. I have the joy of serving as our Bush Lake campus pastor, which launches in T minus three Sundays. So the countdown begins. Yeah, we're so excited for what God is up to. And we're excited to be a part of this incredible journey. We are wrapping up our series today called Pathways. And so I want to invite you to go ahead and pull out your teaching notes. And it's inside your program there. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, but over the last several weeks, we've looked at this topic of pathways, of what it looks like to uh, live into discipleship. That's a big uh, buzzword that we've been addressing, and we've brought definition to it. We, will, we ultimately say that here at Westwood, discipleship is this. It is being and living like Jesus. All right, discipleship is being and living like Jesus. If that's our goal for every single person who comes to the doors here on Sunday mornings and throughout the rest of the week to be and to live like Jesus, then the next question is, well, how do we do that? What does this look like? What's our strategy for this? And we've ultimately clarified this in our discipleship pathway. It means to worship, belong, serve, and go. And Pastor Joel has asked us each and every week to recite this, so would you please join me in saying that? Worship, uh, discipleship pathway is worship, belong, serve, and go. One more time, worship, belong, serve, and go. Excellent. Y'all sell so great. That's good. Well, today we're going to be talking about worship. And if you're pretty sharp, you're probably sitting there and thinking to yourself, wait, isn't worship supposed to be at the beginning? And you're right. I'll address that here in just a moment. But I want to take a quick aside and note how funny it is that they asked perhaps the least musically inclined individual to speak on the topic of worship today. Now, when I was a young boy, I was fairly musically talented. In fact, I was part of the glorious Andy Woods Elementary Honors Choir. Yeah, exactly. Woo, that's so good. I was, it was when I was in fourth grade, you know, I could sing, I could dance, I could hold a tune, it was great. But then something tragic happened when I entered into fifth grade. My voice dropped. And I'll never forget how embarrassed I was when I went into audition for that fifth grade honors choir when I sang Rockin' Robin, and I should have picked a Johnny Cash tune instead. Perhaps Folsom Prison Blues or something like that. I can't sing. And in fact, the thing that causes me most anxiety on Sunday mornings isn't standing in front of you to speak, but rather it's the fear that they're going to forget to mute my microphone during the worship set. All right, just a moment of honesty there. And perhaps maybe some of you feel the same way. You know, you come in and we begin with a couple of worship songs and you don't want those around you to hear you singing. And so you choose not to sing. And that's okay. There's no guilt there if that's the case. But for others of you, you might also feel some sort of similar dread of like, okay, we've got to begin our worship services with a couple of songs. And it just kind of fills you with tension. I believe that a lot of this, though, stems from a very narrow def definition that we have of worship. And that's really my hope today, is that we will leave this morning, this afternoon, having a far greater understanding of what worship truly is. You see, because I believe that worship is more than just singing, though that is an important part of it, but worship is a lifestyle. Okay, and so why are we concluding our Pathway series with the topic of worship? Well, it really stems from the big idea that we have for today, and the big idea is this. Worship is the fuel of our discipleship journey. Okay, worship is the fuel for our discipleship journey. A heart of worship, a lifestyle is, of worship is the fuel for as we worship, belong, serve, and go. And we've said it over the last several weeks that faith is a journey, not just a destination. 
And so we have to have fuel on this journey. Much like a car that's trying to go from one place to the next, if a car is lacking gasoline, it's not going to go anywhere. And so we need fuel. And so if this lifestyle of worship is fuel, then we often ask this question then. Okay, how do we then worship God as a lifestyle? And that's really what we'll look at today. We'll look to answer that question. How do we worship God as a lifestyle? You see, I believe that worshiping God as a lifestyle is attainable for all of us. It doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, a businesswoman, a stay-at-home parent, or a middle school student. We can all worship God as a lifestyle. And the text that we're going to be looking at that's going to bring clarity to this comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. You'll see it there at the top of your teaching notes. And so I invite you to track along. But as we walk through Romans 12, 1 through 2, we'll see three key points. We'll see first the power of worship. Second, we'll see the process of worship. And the third, we'll see the practice of worship. All right, but let's go ahead and dive in. Let's take a look at Romans 12 and see what the Apostle Paul says. He penned these words. He said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, that leads us to the very first point that we come across, which is the power of worship. And the power of worship is this. Worship is our response to our merciful God and his merciful acts. Okay, worship is our response to our merciful God and his merciful acts. All right, Paul begins Romans 12 with one key word. And I think a lot of times we breeze past certain words that are very, very important. A lot of times we think that they're insignificant, but it's the word therefore. And when I was in seminary, they wanted to elevate this idea of, you know, we got to stop and read the text because they gave us this cute little saying. They said, whenever you come across a therefore in scripture, you need to pause and ask, what's it there for? You like that? All right, good. You see, because what Paul is doing is he's using this connective conjunction to tie together Romans chapter 1 through 11 with Romans chapter 12 through 16. And so Romans chapter 12, especially verses 1 and 2, is really the watershed moment of the entire book of Romans. And so what Romans 1 through 11 is speaking of is is the mercy of God and how he is a merciful acting God. And because of his mercy, because of the way that he interacts with us, therefore, this is how we should live our lives. And he lays that out in chapters 12 through 16. But we've got to ask this question, what is it that's so foundational and so core to our Christian faith? It comes from chapters 1 through 11. I mean, Romans 3, it, it speaks about this. Paul says, there is none who is righteous, no, not one. What he's saying is that we are all fallen, sinful, broken beings living in a fallen, sinful, and broken world. I mean, we see it all around us, don't we? We see bullying happening in school. We see the senseless and callous taking of lives in Pittsburgh last weekend. And we also see it within the interpersonal conflicts amongst our relationships. Not only that, but we also internally feel this drive to gain affection and and adoration and affirmation from other people or from God himself. Nothing is going to solve this problem. Nothing is going to solve this dilemma. Education won't. Our own good deeds and our own good merits won't. Something has to come from outside of us to solve this problem. And Paul speaks about that in Romans 5. He says this, But God showed his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. You notice what he says there? While we were yet sinners. It doesn't say while we were holy saints, while we were doing good things, then Christ Jesus came. Rather, what it says is in our sinfulness and in our brokenness, Christ came and he loved us and he died for us to show us what? His mercy. And it's all of this mercy that informs the rest of our lives. I love what Jesus did. He came and he submitted himself to something that he didn't deserve, namely death, to give us something that we didn't deserve, namely life. And he ushered in a new way of doing things. The old way said, you know what? You worship and you sacrifice and therefore you might get some grace and you might get some love and you might get some mercy. But now what Jesus is saying is he's saying, you know what? I'm gonna bring mercy and love and grace to you. Therefore, you worship and you sacrifice all of our lives and worship is lived as grateful response to what Christ has done for us. That's why we say uh, the power of worship is the merciful God and his merciful acts. That's what we've got to remember. And as I think about this, there's no better person uh, than Paul himself who really knew God's mercy. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor Joel interviewed Brother John who uh, works overseas. He's with Voice of the Martyrs and his organization is called Ananias' House. But I invite you, if you didn't 
hear Pastor Joel's talk last week as he interviewed Brother John, go back and listen to it. It will inspire you in many ways as we learn what it means to go and make disciples. But as I was sitting there thinking, Ananias is one of those unsung heroes in the Bible. You see, because he got a word from God, he wanted to, to go and pray for this guy named Paul. Paul was going around crucifying and murdering and approving the killing of Christians throughout his life. And all of a sudden, Ananias is called to go and pray for him. And he's like, are you sure? And he's like, yes, I want you to go. And so finally, Ananias goes and he lays hands on Paul and he begins to pray for him. And it's through and because of Ananias that Paul sees the mercy of Jesus. And all of a sudden, Paul, the persecutor, becomes Paul, the proclaimer. And he goes all throughout modern day Turkey and Greece, planting churches so that people might know the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. And he goes back and he writes letters to these churches and sends them off. And he's credited with pinning nearly half of the New Testament because of his work. But the thing that I love most about Paul is Paul knew where he came from. He knew what he was capable of. He knew his brokenness. I mean, he wrote these words to Timothy. He, he said this, the saying is trustworthy and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to die for sinners of whom I am the worst. Okay, you want to brag about something? Brag about your brokenness and your sinfulness because here's the thing. Whenever we begin to see the brokenness in our lives, we begin to see God's mercy in new and profound ways. And so the way that this really relates for us is something I like to call kingdom mathematical proportions. All right, and this is what I mean. When you think about your sin and your fallenness and your brokenness, if you take a large view of your brokenness and your sin, then you will naturally take a large view of God's mercy and God's grace. Similarly, if you take a small view of your brokenness and your sin, you will take a small view of God's mercy and God's grace. Man, I pray that we will be people who say, you know what, I'm broken and I'm sinful, and I'm fallen. But you know what? God's grace and God's mercy is far greater than anything that I have done wrong. And when I begin to see mercy and new light, that will naturally swell our hearts to give worship to God because that will be the power that we have within worship because all of our life is lived in response to the merciful God and his merciful acts. There's no shame in acknowledging that. There's only life in that because his mercy is greater than anything we might feel about ourselves. The power of worship is this. That worship is our response to our merciful God and his merciful actions. That's our first point. But now we come to our second point, which is the process of worship. And the process of worship is this. Worship is when our internal values become externally visible. All right, worship is when our internal values become externally visible. All right, let's pick back up in verse two. This is what Paul says. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul continues talking about this process, and he uses two really key words. He uses the word conform. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, to the patterns of this age. And he uses the word transform. Now, conform is an important word, because really what it's saying is that the, the world, that this age is trying to fit us into a mold. It's trying to impress and push us down to make us look and act and think and behave a certain way that the world wants us to behave. All right, the image that I get a lot of times is just imagine it's, it's Christmas time or it's Thanksgiving and you've got a giant piece of dough on your countertop and you take that cookie cutter and you begin to press it upon that dough. And what do you have? You have the shape of that mold. I think that that's what Paul is getting at. He's saying, do not conform. Do not allow this mold to shape your life. Though the world is externally pushing in upon you, what I want you to do is not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whereas conformity is external, transformation begins internally. He's saying, allow what God is doing within you, within this mercy that he's working within your lives, to, to wrestle within you, to stir up within you, and allow that then to be slowly, in a way, moved externally so that the world around you will see the work of God within you. And that word transform is so important. It's used only a handful of other times in the New Testament. The most prominent time is in the gospel accounts. When it says that Jesus took his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, he took them up the mountaintop, and it said, there Jesus transformed, or there Jesus transfigured in front of them. And what ultimately happened is what was inside of Jesus became externally visible to them. And it said that he was shining in so much bright and lightness that they couldn't even see and behold how glorious he truly was. That's what I believe Paul is calling us to. 
is he's saying allow that work that God is doing inside of you, that mercy that's taken root in your life to become externally visible to the world around you. Now, I think that there's really one deterrent that keeps us from allowing our internal values to become externally visible, and it's the word compartmentalization. All right, I know it's early in the morning. All right, maybe some of you didn't get as much sleep with that fallback hour, but that's okay. So what is compartmentalization? Well, I want to use one image to describe this to you. And uh, compartmentalization to me really looks a lot like this. Good old cafeteria tray. All right, now maybe for some of you, this brought back good memories. Maybe for others, not so good. You've got your own Andy Woods Elementary Honors Choir memories that come to mind, or you smell burnt mac and cheese from that time. Or if you're like Pastor Joel, he raved about his time drinking chocolate milk, but neither here nor there. So you've got this cafeteria tray, and you begin to place all the, the delightful foods on it. You know, maybe this comes in. Maybe this is first. We'll put that first. Why not? You got your dessert. You got your side dishes. You got your corn on the cob. You always need that, right? And then you've got your low-fat milk. And the point of this is to, to really show you, as we think about it, you know, sometimes our life looks like this, where everything is nice, neat, and tidy. There are little walls built up, you know, one food doesn't cross over and impact the other food. But I really think that this is what Paul is getting at. Because he's saying the world is trying to conform us to live a certain way. The world wants us to, to build these dividing walls amongst very various facets of our lives. It's saying, you know what, our job, our eight to five is the main course that we're going to put right there front and center. And you know what, maybe our faith is going to take one little compartment off to the side and you know, our hobbies are going to take one other area. And, and ultimately what we do is we say, you know what, maybe our faith is just reserved for that one little compartment, that one hour on Sunday mornings. Because that's what the world says, right? It says faith doesn't belong in the workplace, Faith doesn't belong in the public square. Faith belongs at home. Paul's saying, you know what? Dissolve this. Allow your internal values to become externally visible. And so if our lives and if our faith are not supposed to look like a cafeteria tray, what is it supposed to look like? It should look like this. <laughs> Little chicken pot pie. Can I get an amen? amen? So how is a chicken pot pie different than a cafeteria tray? Whereas a cafeteria tray has all of these different boundaries built up, a chicken pot pie, not so much. All of the ingredients work together. The green beans, all the filling, that delightful filling, all works together for one singular taste. I think that that's what Paul is getting at. He's saying, don't be conformed. Don't allow these dividing walls, don't allow these boundaries to exist in your life, but allow what God has done within you internally to become externally visible. That's the process of worship. We've seen the power of worship, we've seen the process of worship, and now we come to the third point, this practice of worship. And so we asked that question that we posed at the beginning, how do we worship God as a lifestyle? Well, the answer is this, I believe. It's this, worship God by doing the right thing at the right time, all the time. Okay, worship God by doing the right thing at the right time, all the time. Now, if you were to look back at your text, you would see in verse one that there is a phrase that says, this is your true and proper worship. Okay, and that one little phrase is, is so important. In fact, if you were to pull out different Bible translations, there might be different phrases amongst the, the, the different translations that you have there before you because this word is robust in its meaning. And I think ultimately the, the word originally meant this idea of uh, an individual committing him or her, herself to work for pay. Submitting for work, for pay. But then it kind of evolved and it changed to, to come up with this idea of, of volunteering and giving of oneself until finally the third idea is giving of oneself to the work of beauty. And I think Paul is really adjusting and, and adopting that idea that it's saying it's, it's bringing all of ourselves to the whole of God. What it means is every single fiber of who we are and what we do is brought under the vision and the direction of God. What it means is every single second of every single minute of every single hour of every single day is brought to God. That's what it looks like to worship God as a lifestyle. That's why we say it's worship God by doing the right thing at the right time all the time. Now I want to take a quick time out and say, okay, what happens though if we have this idea but we disconnect it from uh, the first two points? What if we disconnect this idea of I'm going to worship God by doing the right thing at the right time all the time without God's mercy? Well, I really think that we can run into one of two extremes. The first extreme is if we say, you know what, I'm going to do the right thing at the right time, 
but I'm not going to have a view to God's mercy. I'm going to do it on my own strength. Then we slide into this idea that our faith is all about morality. And it's all about do good, try harder. It's all about I'm doing all of these works so that God might approve me and affirm me. And when we do that, when we start to uh, live this life that we're doing the right thing at the right time all the time, that can naturally breed within us a sense of arrogance and self-righteousness because what happens whenever other people can't live up to that same standard that we live up to? No, 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 what we see is that we're called to look to God's mercy, that his mercy propels us and empowers us and we have received mercy and therefore we show mercy to those around us. It's not us, it's not me that's doing the right thing at the right time, but it's God working in and through me. That's the first extreme. But the second extreme, if we were to say, you know what, I'm gonna do the right thing at the right time all the time, we disconnect it from God's mercy, is this. I wanna take a quick poll for you. So for everyone here and those joining us online and in Woodside, let me ask you this. How many of you this last week did not do the right thing at the right time all the time? Show of hands, yep. Okay, yeah, probably Woodside, everyone's hands up. And if your hand is not up, uh, you're lying. And so your hand should be up now, uh, but my hand's up included. And here's the thing though, this is what makes our lifestyle of worship so robust. It's because we're seldom gonna get it right. This isn't a declaration, rather this is an invitation into something greater that Jesus calls us into. And so we don't feel shame, we don't feel guilt, but rather when we get to that point, we're saying, man, you know what? I didn't do the right thing. God's grace and God's mercy is there. And once again, his mercy covers all. I mean, his mercy is far greater than our wrongdoings, isn't it? His mercy is far greater than our shame, is it not? And so that's what we lean on. His mercy propels us and empowers us to do the right thing at the right time, all the time. And so how do we do this? You know, because I, like I said before, I believe that a lifestyle of worship is attainable for anyone. It doesn't matter if you're going to work, if you're a business person, if you're a middle school student. I believe you can worship God in every single environment, whether you're on the board, you're, you're uh, on your homeowners association, or yes, even if you're in the car driving to soccer practice and you're stuck in traffic. It looks like this. It's saying, God, you know what? You've given me mercy. My life is going to be living in response to that. And because you are stirring something within me, this internal value is becoming externally visible. And so God, my values are this. I want to see peace flourish throughout the world. I want my kids' schools to experience production and, and peace and flourishing. I want my kids to never have to question if their parents love them. What it might look like for us, if you're a business person and you're really just trying to grapple with this idea of what does it mean to worship God? What it looks like is to do the right thing at the right time. What it means is to be the best manager, the best leader, the best coworker, to seek the production and the flourishing of your business and of your company, not for your own good, but for God's glory. Okay, if you're an artist, what it means to worship God is to be the best curator of art, to do everything in your power, because that's how God created you to be, and to give it all back to him and joyful gladness. You know, this really landed for me back when I was a teenager. I had just finished up high school. Uh, I went to this high school retreat camp and I had one of those incredible encounters with the living God that I'll never forget. But I was about to head off and go and play junior hockey. And I really felt, you know, God calling me to want to wanna live my life in a new and profound way. But I had this tension that I was experiencing. Maybe you've had it too. You've got two mutually exclusive things that you don't know how to resolve and reconcile. On the one hand, I had hockey. And on the other hand, I had following Jesus. Okay, one wanted me to be a self-promoter and pursue everything for my own gain, and the other, not so much. And I remember I brought this tension towards one of my friends, and I was like, okay, I don't know what to do here. And he paused and he asked me this question. He said, Zach, do you believe that God created all things? I said, well, yeah, of course I do. And he said, do you think God created you to have that feeling that you feel? whenever you make one of those incredible glove saves and you completely shift the momentum of the game. I was like, well, yeah, of course I do. And he said, do you believe that God created within you this sense of belonging, this sense of desire to be in uh, communion with your teammates, to experience camaraderie after you win a big game or a big tournament? I said, well, yeah, of course. He said, that's what it looks like to honor God. So be the best hockey player. Work the hardest. Get on the ice first and get off the ice last. Not for your good, not for your own promotion, but for God's glory and for the good of those around you. And I love what Pastor Mark Nelson says over at Minnetonka. He says this, you know what? I should be able to worship God when I eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> Think about it. God created us with taste buds. 
He didn't have to do it, but he did. So when we are enjoying something like that, we can say, wow, God, thank you for that. And, and I roll it back up to you and I worship you and I honor you because of the way that you created me for that. God, may you be honored and glorified in my life. Well, I want to drill this down even more practically. And what you'll notice at the bottom of your teaching notes is that there is one final fill in the blank. It goes something like this. It's a prompting question. Over the next 24 hours, I can worship God by fill in the blank. And I have no content for you for that. That's something that you can fill in yourself. But I want you to reflect on it. Over the next 24 hours, where will you be? Will you be on the way to the airport? Will you be in a meeting? Will you have brunch with a friend? And think about it. How can you worship God in that moment? You know, maybe for some of you what it looks like. It looks like responding to that email you received with hate and vitriol from a customer or a coworker and responding to it with love and grace. What it might look like if you're a student with us today to worship God by doing the right thing at the right time. What it might mean is to reach out to that classmate who's been overlooked and left out from the rest of the group. What it might look like for you to do the right thing at the right time, to worship God wherever you find yourself tomorrow, is to pause and take five minutes and offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for everything that God has done for you and through you. We can worship God by doing the right thing at the right time all the time. Well, I want us to return to that opening big idea that we saw. Uh, we said that worship is the fuel for our discipleship journey. All right, worship is the fuel as we worship, belong, serve, and go. And so as we're stepping into this environment of Sunday morning worships, a, a lifestyle of worship, it fuels us to say, God, I want to value, I want to cherish you above all else, and I want these internal values to become externally visible. When we step into belonging in a group, a lifestyle of worship fuels us not to just fit in, but to properly belong and say, God, transform me. When we step into serving on a team, a lifestyle of worship says, God, take the, the gifts, the strengths, and the passions that I have and leverage them for your glory and for the good of those around us. And as we step into going, as we live this life on mission to go and make disciples, a lifestyle of worship fuels us to say, God, I am powerless without you. Go with me, work in and through me to do things through me that only you can do. You can do the right thing at the right time, all the time as we worship God. And there's no better way to be reminded of this than by coming to the table this morning. You see, because worship begins with a radical reorientation to God. And so as we receive these elements, as they're passed and as you're holding them in your hand, may you pause and reflect and remember that we're holding these because it is a merciful God and his merciful actions that Christ died in our place. And as we hold the cup, we're saying, God, may my internal values become externally visible for the good of those around us. And so may we be people who do the right thing at the right time, all the time, because God's mercy propels us, his love provides for us, and his presence goes with us. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious Father, we come before you now, and we are reminded of the words the Lord, the Lord, a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God, we ask that you will swell up our hearts with a newfound sense of love and a newfound sense of adoration for who you are and what you've done on our behalf. How you've given us mercy and you've given us grace even when we were so undeserving of it. You continue to pour it out. And so Lord, as we receive these elements, May we remember the sacrifice that you've made. May we remember the love that you've poured out. And may that change and transform our lives. Not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. May you be honored. May you be glorified in this time. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. Amen.